invite you to take your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to be spending most of our time this morning in Hebrews 3 as we continue our series on the one and others in the Scriptures. Uh, you know, as we've uh, been seeing changes in our, in our nation, changes in, in our culture over the last, uh, especially the last 18 months or so, uh, we thought as things start to open up and as we begin to see people coming together again, it would be really helpful to our testimony as believers in the Lord Jesus to understand and act on some of the one another's in God's holy word. And so we've been working through this um, for several weeks now. Last week, you know, we looked at admonishing one another. And do you remember as we closed last week, there was one thing that we could not separate from admonishment. Remember what that is? Encouragement. So we're going to follow up this message on admonishment. And remember, admonishment is not scolding or anything like that. It's, it's, it's spurring one another on. It's that idea from Hebrews 10 of spurring one another on toward love and, and, and good works. Sometimes it, it involves uh, giving direction. But we found that we cannot separate admonishment from encouragement. And so what I'd like to do is follow kind of the same outline as we did last week and ask ourselves a few questions uh, of the text, only we're going to be staying mostly in Hebrews. we got a couple other verses we're going to take a look at. But uh, in Hebrews 3, we'll get there in a minute, we see the word encouragement show up at, toward the end of our passage. But we want to ask ourselves, first of all, what encouragement is not? <laughs> what is encouragement? What isn't it? You know what? I, I was surprised when I dug into this word a little bit. And, you know, I, I found out that, you know, sometimes when we give the attaboys and, or attagirls and the pats on the back and all that stuff, or, or, wow, your hair looks really good today, you know, that kind of thing, that's not encouragement. It's not making someone feel good about themselves. It's, it's not, in essence, it's not flattery. Uh, you know, if you think about it, in the song we just sang, uh, that word discouraged showed up, didn't it? Don't be discouraged. What? God is over all. So if we really think about it, encouragement is kind of the exact opposite of discouragement, isn't it? We just change out the first few words, uh, that word courage, and we find out that it's a totally different thing. Well, what is kind of the Bible dictionary definition of encouragement then? Uh, the root of this word is to make a call. Parakaleo is, is the word from which this word encouragement comes. Um, it's to make a call, to call out to someone else with whom you're in a relationship or, and I put out here to make a call in the context of a relationship. Now, if you think about it, sometimes when you're discouraged, sometimes you make a call and sometimes I'm just not having a good day. I, I, I guess I have to get rid of this gesture and do something more like this because we, we really don't have the handsets anymore. We have the handsets, but you get the idea. Um, Making a call in the context of a relationship. Sometimes we make the call, but in the context of biblical encouragement, we see someone who is discouraged. It would be for us to make that call. For what purpose? And that's, that's the key here. For the purpose of strengthening someone else or being strengthened yourself. To make a call in the context of a relationship for the purpose of strengthening or being strengthened. Now, uh, encouragement then is, is not congratulations or anything like that. It's, it has a purpose. And it's to have someone come out of a conversation, someone come out of a situation, being stronger than they were when they came in. And so that's the idea here, to make a call in the context of a relationship 
for the purpose of being strengthened. Now, we found out that the word admonishment was used only eight times in the Scriptures last week. Encouragement occurs 109 times in the New Testament alone. And so, are Christians supposed to encourage one another? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we are supposed to encourage one another. It's used that many times. And so, using that idea, we will find out that there are specific ways in which biblical encouragement occurs. Now, we're going to major on this next week as we, uh, the application point will be how do we encourage people around us in America? How does America need encouragement? Well, I'll just plant the seed now, and this is uh, pretty much the outline for next week. Biblical encouragement occurs most of the time in bringing comfort and consolation. Think about when we're discouraged, thinking all is lost. No, uh, we can receive comfort from the heart of God. We receive comfort from the Word of God. We receive comfort from brothers and sisters in Christ. Comfort and consolation. In fact, uh, your translation might use that word comfort when this word that's generally translated encouragement occurs. Comfort and consolation, very, very important to understanding biblical encouragement. Another use of this word is in the context of teaching and instruction. Now, sometimes when you pick up God's Word, when you do your devotions, when you uh, hear a message, either here or you watch a video or you pull something up on YouTube or you're listening to Christian radio, whatever it is, Sometimes we are strengthened, sometimes we are encouraged in this way through what? Through teaching and instruction. When teaching and instruction comes from the Word of God for the purpose of strengthening our spiritual lives, that is encouragement from the Word of God. Often, teaching and instruction uh, is a key to this idea of biblical encouragement when we find ourselves picking up something new or, or finding an, an area in which the Lord wants to work in our lives, then we're encouraged to do so. And that's the idea here through His Word being taught and given to us. Uh, another way is this, uh, entreaty and exhortation. Now this uh, doesn't happen quite as often in the biblical uses of the word encouragement, but this idea of entreaty when we want to encourage someone to act in a certain way, when we call on people to take heed to a warning that we are being led to give them, when we would uh, say to uh, the nation, for example, to turn from sin and follow the Lord Jesus, that would be an entreaty, when we kind of beg someone to follow through on what God's Word says. Or exhortation, that's the same idea. Speaking God's truth in a situation where it's being ignored, uh, calling people to righteousness, that would be another use of the word encouragement. So what is encouragement? We see what it's not, but we also see what it is. So then, when is encouragement appropriate? Let's turn to Hebrews 3, chapter uh, 3, verse 13. We're going to start toward the end of the passage, then we're going to come back to it uh, in a little bit. When is encouragement appropriate? The first uh, thing we want to see is that, uh, as the writer of Hebrews puts it, but encourage one another daily, every day, every day. Daily. Even when we don't feel like it, we need to encourage one another. We need to be calling on people and working towards strengthening them. If we know someone is discouraged, if we know someone's having a hard time, we are to make that call. Encouragement is appropriate every day. Not just on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Not just on Sunday. Or Saturday. I know some of us have six Saturdays and one Sunday, but you know it's every day, 
Every day it's appropriate. And then the writer of Hebrews puts it in a different context. And I think that's why encouragement is so important. When we read the rest of verse 13, it says, as long as it is called today, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today. Hmm. As long as it's called today. Well, we know Jesus is coming back. He's coming back at any day, any time now, any hour, Jesus could return. He could return before we conclude our time here this morning. And so we want to take a look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to see how this word encouragement weaves itself into this instruction from the writer of Hebrews to encourage one another every day as long as it's called today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. Now, the first part of chapter 4, uh, Paul speaks to the Thessalonian people about how they live their lives and, and to be sure that they're living their lives in such a way that God is pleased with the, the conduct of their lives. And then he goes on and says this, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. You might have seen the book, He's Gonna Toot and I'm Gonna Scoot. <laughs> yeah, the, the trumpet call. We sing when the roll is called up yonder, and we sing about the trumpet call uh, of the Lord. When we hear that trumpet sound, when, when, the, when that piercing, all-consuming coming back of the Lord Jesus is introduced with that sound. Wow, we see what's going to happen. No matter how bad things seem to be getting here on this planet, no matter how much our cities are in turmoil, no matter how much falsehood and evil is seeming to get the headlines, no matter what, Jesus is coming back. And we see the circumstances that will happen. Now look at verse 14. We don't need to be, uh, verse 13, we don't need to be ignorant or to grieve. No, we believe. And, you know, as, as a pastor, but also as, as a law enforcement chaplain, I, I have seen people grieve having no hope. Oh, I'm so thankful that uh, those in our church family, we, we have hope. We grieve, but we don't grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We grieve knowing. We still grieve believing. And you know what? When we say goodbye here, we'll, we know we'll see people that have that same love for the Lord Jesus. We know we'll see them again. And while separation sometimes is hard, we know we have that faith that God is big enough, and that he will bring, as it says in verse 14, he'll bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. What a blessing. What a blessing that is. And then it gets even better from there, because when that trumpet sounds, we see Jesus, and we will be caught up. The rapture will occur, and we will meet them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Wow. 
Back when I was in college, uh, we got talking a lot about the rapture. And there were some that, oh, I can't, the word rapture is not in the Bible. And all that kind of stuff. Well, this meeting in the air, that's, that, that, that's what it is. I don't, we don't need to teach that all over again here now. But uh, we talked about uh, you know, what that's going to be like. And uh, one of the guys in the dorm, he, uh, he was kind of a goofball anyway. He, he jumped off his bunk and, and he landed on the floor. And he said, well, I, I thought I'd try some rapture practice here. <laughs> it, it didn't work very well. But uh, by God's own strength and by God's own power, we don't need to practice. We just need to be ready. I trust you're ready, that you know the Lord Jesus. Verse 18, though, is what we want to take a look at. All of this, verses 13 through 17, therefore, and you know, what's it there for? In light of the blessed hope that we have in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore encourage one another with these words. Strengthen one another. Look at the times in which we're living, where things are not perhaps going the way we would like them to go, where it seems that evil and, and falsehood and the wrong way of living, uh, questioning what God has put so very clear in his word, questioning it and, and twisting it and, and turning it upside down and landing it on its head to try to excuse sin. Uh, no, Jesus is coming back, and it's going to be all fixed. <coughs> Therefore, encourage each other with these words, because, you know, it's just the right time. At just the right time, that time that God has ordained, that God has established, we will be taken up, and we will meet the Lord in the air. Praise God for that. When is encouragement appropriate? Every day, while it is still called today, and we see, therefore, encourage one another with these words, because you know what? Tomorrow, tomorrow might be too late, because tomorrow will never come. There was another 100-year-old lady who had a little impact in my life back when I was a teenager, and, uh, and uh, she, um, she lived her life in such a way that you know, she couldn't see, she could barely walk, but you know what? She had, uh, she had hope in the Lord Jesus, and she said, she said to me, I don't know what I was worried about one day, uh, but she says, don't worry about tomorrow. Because if tomorrow doesn't come, it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> I've carried that with me all these years. If tomorrow doesn't come, it doesn't matter anyway. Hmm. Encourage one another with these words. Um, going back to Hebrews 3, when is it appropriate to encourage? Let's take a look at an example from the history of Israel. Now, this is also written for us in Psalm 95. So it's nearly a direct translation of the Hebrew into the Greek, now into the English. Uh, when is it ex uh, appropriate? Well, we need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and know God's ways. Take a look at Hebrews 3, verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, we need to hear his voice. And then again, we see uh, further down in the passage, we need to see that we need to know God's ways. Verse 10, at the very end, uh, we see that God has indicted the people of Israel that they have not known his ways. When we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, when we don't block our ears, when we don't close our eyes, when we take in what the Spirit has for us in his word and in, as his Spirit speaks to our spirit, we have a choice. We can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and know God's ways or, or what? Or we can harden our hearts. Or we can rebel against God. 
or we can put the Lord God to the test. When we do these things, um, we face judgment from God. So if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Uh, now, there was a time when God's, well, there were many times when God's people stood up against him and they questioned his ways. They outright disobeyed him. We could point out some very specific things. But we find out that uh, as they rebelled against God from the time he from, from the time he gave them just the very first law, which was that, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then there's another rebellion in the time of testing in the desert. Well, we know when that was, right? Hey, you know, you people go wander for 40 years. And that 40 years of wandering in, in the wilderness that time of testing, what did the people of Israel do? They complained. They complained they were hungry. They complained they were thirsty. They wanted. So, after the mistake of striking the rock and getting water out of it, well, they ended up getting water. But then, you know, God provided food for them every morning. Mana, mana. What is it? Manna. And sometimes they would have manna cakes and manna burgers and manna this and manna that. And they get tired of that. Said, Give us some meat to eat. And so and they're grumbling and, and testing and trying. God gave them quail. So much quail that it came up over their ankles. And they complained about that. Don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. Hmm. When we harden our hearts as individuals and as a people group, when we harden our hearts, we go astray. We don't agree with God anymore that right is right and wrong is wrong. We would much rather follow the temptation of our enemy and twist what he says is right and what is wrong. We'll put God to the test. Like he has to prove himself in anything or in any way. And when that happens, look at verse 10. That is why I was angry with that generation. Do you want to experience God's anger? Do you want some loved ones to experience God's anger? I, I know I, I don't want to experience God's anger. I don't want to experience God's wrath. I don't want to experience not entering into a state of judgment where I will never see God's rest. Wow. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. Oh, so what is God's solution in encouragement? Why encourage? Well, first of all, we see these words in verse 12, see to it. In other words, uh, the word used here is open your eyes. Open your eyes. Don't, don't go like this, but open your eyes and really look around. Open your eyes. See to it. Open your eyes and act on what you see. See to it that what? See to it that none of us, none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. In other words, see to it that your brothers and sisters, if they're discouraged, if they're down, if they're questioning, see to it that they do not repeat Israel's sin and rebellion. That's why we encourage. We encourage one another so that we have the courage to continue walking with Jesus, even through the deepest waters, even through the muckiest mud, even through the darkest night. No matter what comes our way, if we are encouraged, 
we will still turn our hearts toward God rather than away. So then what are some results? What are some results? Look at the third part of verse 13. You notice if you've, if you, some, I, know, I know you like to keep track of me here, and I didn't finish verse 13, so I'm going to finish it now. Planned it that way. Uh, why do we encourage one another daily as long as it's called today? It's so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You ever had a hard heart? My doctor tells me that there are parts of my heart that uh, are in danger of becoming hard. So I got to change my diet. I got to cut back on, on that stuff that would harden the arteries. You know, got to eat more of your peppers, bro. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. But you know, there can be a hardness of heart that doesn't come from what we eat, but it comes from how we engage in lifestyle that's not pleasing to God. But if we're encouraging one another as we ought, we will not be hardened by sin's deceit because we'll have a constant input of encouragement, not discouragement. We'll have a constant input of building one another up. And now that's, that, that's kind of the, the cousin to this word uh, encouragement. We'll get to that later on in the summer. Another result of encouraging one another as we continue on now in verse 14, we have come to share in Christ. Yeah. Sharing in Christ as a result of encouraging one another. Now, was it encouraging to hear one another count our blessings? Do you feel stronger by something that someone said during the service today? That's why we do that, that we might encourage one another by, you know, when we see God work, and when we see God work in people's situations, perhaps they've struggled with something for a long time, or maybe it's just a, wow, this just happened. When we see that God is alive and he is real and he loves us and he cares for us and he acts on our behalf, and we know that we love that same Jesus, that's sharing in Christ. That's sharing in the power of his resurrection. That's sharing in the relationship that we have in Christ. And the more we share our relationship with Christ with one another, the more we share some of the blessings, the more we share some of the uh, victories, the more we share the, some of the struggles, knowing that God wins in the end. And then finally... As we win those victories, we see in the last part of verse 14, we'll share if we hold firmly till the end in the confidence that we had at first. You remember when you first came to the Lord? How exciting that was, the joy that was in your life, that burden of sin being lifted, and knowing that you had an eternal home in heaven. That confidence that we had in first, sometimes, you know, Satan sees that and he wants to rob our joy. He wants to discourage us. That's why we need to encourage one another. And as we encourage one another more and more and more, we are able to hold to our convictions. Until what? As long as it's called today. We'll hold our convictions. What are convictions? Our convictions are those truths that are founded in the holy word of God, giving us principles by which we live our lives, principles on which we build our faith. That which we know is true and will be true yesterday, today, and forever. Those things incorporated into our lives, those are our convictions. And the result, a result of encouragement, is being able to hold to our convictions to the very end, to the day we see Jesus face to face, whether, like Jean Moran likes to say, our brother, our sister Jean, here, there, or in the air, when we see one another again. Where are you discouraged? Thinking all is lost.
count your blessings, but also make the call. Call out to God for encouragement. Call out to a brother or sister in Christ for encouragement because we want to see one another hold on to our convictions to the very end and share in the joy that we have in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your holy word. Thank you, Father, that your word teaches us that we know that you hold the future. And as you hold the future, Father, we know that uh, we will see you face to face. But sometimes when this road of this life is difficult, we need some encouragement. So, Father, help us to hear the voice of your Spirit. Help us, Lord, to seek out the consolation that we need from you and from one another. And Lord, when we as brothers and sisters in Christ see someone else struggling, help us, Lord, to reach out and offer comfort just by a ministry of presence even. So Lord, we ask that we would be encouraged to walk with you this week. Thank you, Father, for the encouragement that we receive from your, from your hand, from your spirit, and from your word. We ask your blessing now as we go from this place. In Jesus' name we pray.